Okay. So, um, hi everybody. Uh, this is uh, an experimental um, sort of uh, studio visit that Alessandro and I have decided to do as part of our um, speculative arts research project. Um, we decided to use each other as guinea pigs for a couple <laughs> of interviews. So, um, for this uh, visit, I'm going to, we're sort of like presenting this like an experimental remote studio visit. So I'm gonna walk through a bunch of Alessandro's images, uh, ask him questions and form like a general conversation uh, about the work. And, um, you know, Alessandro, do you wanna say anything before we get started and start showing the images or any preambles? Um, no, I guess not, except I, I guess we're doing this in the hopes of later expanding it to include other kinds of conversations besides just talking about our own artwork and you know maybe also including conversations where we talk to other artists and you know have this kind of um, uh, interaction via uh, video um, and that would be sort of a added component to uh, the SAR uh, uh, material that we've been putting out. That's all I really want to add and my, my phone's ringing for some reason. I okay. Cut that off <laughs> I can't hear it anyway. <laughs> okay, good. Um, all right, cool. So yeah, just to, to mention a little bit of background, um, Alessandro and I met just through the New York art world and kind of seeing each other's work, mutual friends, some uh, curatorial projects that we ended up uh, working on together over the years. And mm. uh, you know, I've always been a big fan of his paintings and I've seen, you know, I've been lucky to see a lot of different progressions in his work. I think that we share uh, the trait of kind of like rapidly going through different kind of oeuvres and movements within our own practice. So uh, it's been really informative to see some of the stuff that Alessandro has produced. And as a craftsman and a thinker, I'm a big fan. So uh, Thanks. really uh, fun to get to do this conversation and uh, looking forward to getting into, I think like the spin that we want to try to have on some of these conversations is to really dive deeply into the symbolism, the meaning of the works, um, the thought process behind why we make them and uh, and try to, you know, be as uh, as as in the weeds as we can, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the works. So um, to that end, we decided to use an experimental methodology of um, showing a bunch of pictures that we can use to seed conversation. Um, some of them will be of Alessandro's work. Some of them will be uh, work that he has informed his work, either stuff that Alessandro has presented or stuff that uh, just came to mind for me when I started looking at the work and thinking about mm -hmm. topics I would want to talk about. So let me see if I can uh, share my application here. Should mention we're both relatively novice Zoom users. At least I am. So uh, I'm very much of a novice here. Yeah. Does this does that work? Do you? You must. I am seeing the PowerPoint right very now. Very good. All yeah. right. So now I get to press slideshow. Interesting. And from beginning. And there we go. All right, interview number one. Yeah, so uh, let's see if I can advance this. Yeah. Oh, there it is. All right, so um, this is, Alessandro, this is one of your more recent paintings, right? This yes, I actually, I have it right behind me. Oh, cool. Right there over in the corner of the studio here. Nice. Um, yeah. And uh, can you tell me, like, just, I guess, um, you know, I'm going to try to start with some really boilerplate stuff. Like, what kind of painter are you? How do you make these things? I mean, to me, they look like so mysterious in their creation, right? And I think a lot of people probably have that um, reaction. You know, they're so immaculate, but then there's, uh, there's ways that they're very uniquely put together. And uh, could you talk about what it's like to make one of these paintings? Right. Uh, that's a very broad question to put. Um, but I think, you know, the other day we were kind of um, talking about this topic, how we have a lot of similarities in terms of an interest in a literary source of thinking about our work or kind of esoteric source of thinking about our work. And there is a similarity in that way, but, um, you know, you're much more of a spontaneous artist and out of your own, uh, your, your work is mainly produced by these um, Kind of spontaneous stream of consciousness like drawings um, my work has that as its origin as one uh, original step uh, maybe the first step in producing the imagery but uh, the actual process of making the paintings like the one that you're seeing here uh, which is called ichor accumulator um, this particular one um, I, a lot of the the icons and the the iconography in the work 
comes out of spontaneous automatic drawing, but the actual product is, itself is something that is, um, I take a lot of time in actually planning it and executing it. And um, there's something very, very slow about making the piece. It's mm -hmm. um, even though the imagery itself has this kind of bubbling up from the subconscious, spontaneous, automatic aspect to it, the actual execution of the piece is something that I, I spend a lot of time doing. So uh, in terms of, of what uh, making the work is like or, or what my approach to painting is like, um, I think I have a bit of a balance between the two. Uh, a source uh, for my imagery that is very spontaneous and coming almost out of nowhere uh, or something that kind of surprises me, I think. You know, it's this, um, uh, you know, something that comes out of automatic drawing or some kind of uh, deep meditation on the imagery and usually what emerges from that is something that's very alien or spontaneous and and strange uh, i find but then the actual process of making the work is very slow it's very meditative and it's something that i get lost in for days uh, mm -hmm. at a time um, is it a uh, would you say your technique has like an old master like um sort of correlation like i see definitely references to kind of like northern renaissance paintings and things and some of the ways that you create light effects and things like that and then much more contemporary and modern things like science fiction illustration yeah. and you know sort of psychedelic art um but as a painter do you consider yourself to use an old master technique or what's the the yeah the, that's interesting the um yeah, yeah I, in terms of the old master technique that kind of can refer to a lot of different things um i i think usually when people use that term they're referring to renaissance or baroque techniques of painting mm -hmm. uh anywhere from da vinci using chiaroscuro to uh you know uh, rembrandt uh using these very gestural marks to build up the surfaces of his paintings mm -hmm. um and all of that influences me um i do think of these uh, in terms of using, you know, that's it. There's, so there's a few levels to that question, to answering that question. Um, so I'm going to try to pick that apart a little bit. Um, there are representational elements in the painting that look very much like Northern Renaissance art, um, like, uh, you know, prints by, you know, the print in, prints of Martin Schoengauer or uh, Matthias Grunwald or something like that with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, his... Um, you know, his altarpiece with the temptation of St. Anthony and all the grotesque imagery and or, or later stuff like Hieronymus Bosch, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so I have that love of detail and surfaces and uh, evoking that. I, I do try to evoke a lot of that with these very traditional techniques and this traditional interest in detail and texture. Um, but there is a very modern uh, sensibility added to these more representational elements. Mm -hmm. And this is something uh, in terms of creating space that I think, think of. And I've said this, or I've written about this a little bit. I, um, I see uh, two different kinds of space in paintings that have been created over the time of history. By the way, I get into rants all the time <laughs> about these topics. So I might get off on a rant here going into uh, the topic of history, but I see uh, a division between two different kinds of space in the history of painting. Uh, there is a, a, a Renaissance space that emerges in the 14th or 15th century from Northern Europe or from Florence or these other centers of, um, of Renaissance art mm -hmm. that is really interested, like like the painter Giotto um, or uh, you know or um, or Jan van Eyck, even the very different artists. But both of them are interested in making you believe that you can walk through the painting and move into a kind of illusionistic space. So you can pass through this painting as though it were a window and come out into some other kind of world. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Uh, goal of painting and the creation of space in a painting that emerges from the Renaissance after the Middle Ages. 
And then, uh, and this is my own way of looking at history. And then at the time of the enlightenment, so the late 17th century into the 18th century, you know, that time period that's after the death of Louis the 14th and right up until about the time of the French revolution, there's this emerging interest in science and the rational mind and logic and, a, and an empirical view mm -hmm. of the universe. And I see some trends in art moving towards being um, uh, almost diagrammatic uh, in the sense that you start to see the early forms of scientific illustration emerge from this time. Maria Siblia Merriam is a, a, a natural history artist from that period that I think of. She's one of, she's most noted for recording the stages of the caterpillar as it evolves from a caterpillar to a chrysalis to a, mm -hmm. a butterfly. Yeah, work. yeah, yeah, great work. And that kind of work or, or, you know, cartography or the early years of archaeology where they start to make renderings of ancient Egyptian temples. And that period of time, as I see it in history, is when art starts to think in an abstract way mm -hmm. about how to delineate empirical knowledge in a specific, diagrammatic, strict kind of way. So I'm, I'm trying to use both perspectives on history to diagram something that is really from the irrational mind. Or it's really interesting. So like the two yeah, of the meditation. touchstones that you've mentioned already have this interesting like kind of dichotomous, um, almost like um, they have a, um, a quality of um, being separated out from each other pretty clearly in the way that we usually think about things. Like you've talked already about the kind of preternat rational, like the sort of um, the immediate like uh, surrealist kind of modality of like uh, finding your images through automatism. Yes. Um, and then you've talked about empiricism as this, uh, this other um, influence on you and this other thing that you're trying to explore. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really revealing to hear you talk about those two things in the way that you're investigating uh, this kind of enlightenment moment, um, but kind of in a way that I think leaves open the door to uh, fantasy and to speculation in a way that maybe was not addressed through uh, empiricism after the enlightenment in the way that, you know, maybe it could have been. Yeah, and I think that um, this split in my work, and this is almost just talking about the formal elements, between a very representational way of painting and a more, I don't want to say abstract because abstract art can refer to just about anything. You know, these are abstract paintings. You know, Jackson Pollock is abstract painting. Um, but a more diagrammatic uh, way of painting, uh, the combination of these two, um, I think it's because I'm, in my mind, uh, sort of split. I'm of two different minds about the subject matter of my work. It's something that I have this sort of uh, very clear system uh, by which I understand it, but then it's also coming from this very irrational, strange mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the Blake quote about uh, fearful symmetry. Yeah. The, uh, the sort <laughs> of like the placement of the romantic uh, in sort of opposition, but also in concert with uh, systematization is, yes. uh, you know, a place. That's of, a great way of putting it. Yes, exactly a very vital place. Yeah. So just wanted to throw up this image of this detail, um, which is, you know, I love how you often will post details of your work on Instagram or whatnot. And it's always really intriguing to me as a painter who never really, I never really feel like I have a great control over what I'm doing for whatever reason. It's just something in the way that I make art keeps me from being able to do this kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think it's really remarkable to just see like the attention to detail and rounding out these spheres and, you know, your uh, sort of facility with uh, points of light, um, you know, sort of like rupturing uh, a flat plane to create three dimensionality. The sort of trompe l'oeil is really, really powers a lot of uh, the, that, it reminds me a little bit of um, Gustave Moreau, how like his paintings are, are super immaculate in, on so many levels, you know, compositionally mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the way lighting up in general, the way he handles light and shadow in his works, but then he has this incredible technique of like kind of stippling out these like really bright, shiny little moments. It's like his whole, uh, the whole canvas shines with these little sparkling, glittering 
sort of beads. And it seems like that's something that's become a really strong interest of yours as well. And I wondered if you had ideas about what those what that means. What are those little little beads and jewels? Well, you know, I I, I sometimes get asked, um, you know, what is the light source here? You know, what are we looking at? Is it the sun? Is it the light in a laboratory? Mm -hmm. Is it the light from a window? Mm, uh, a it question. seems to be this very bright light source, but then when you actually look at the reflection, it looks like this tiny, you know, like a desk lamp or something mm -hmm. like that. Right. Um, yeah, kind of like, you know, and, and maybe that's because I work by that's these funny. little lamps in my apartment here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe I'm getting some direct inspiration. I don't know. Um, I think that for me, this... Um, this sort of crystalline surface um, is a, it's a kind of, um, uh, it's become part of the language of my paintings. Mm -hmm. And I'm starting, and I've started to use it over the last two or three years um, as, a, as a kind of a stand-in for something that is symbolic that I'm trying to represent here. Mm -hmm. um, so, I am trying to represent an actual thing that has volume and physical qualities, a translucence to it, but then it also is um, something that is sort of a, um, uh, a, 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 a symbol or a kind of iconography that I, I, you know, kind of know how to make and put together very easily when I'm making the paintings, mm -hmm. um, if that explains it. But it's interesting what you said about Gustave Moreau, um, because I, there is something about this, the scintillation, you know, uh, of light in his paintings that I do connect with. And I really mm -hmm. love Moreau's work, even though it has a, a different uh, quality to the work I'm doing now. Um, you know, it's much more impressionistic. It's much more painterly. Mm -hmm. um, but he indulges in the pleasure of surfaces and light and shadow in a way that I, I also enjoy when I'm putting mm -hmm. together these works. So, uh, you know, my point that I'm getting at is that sometimes some of my decisions about making certain parts of my paintings translucent or um, giving them a kind of crystalline light uh, sometimes I'm just doing that purely because I think it, it looks nice. And it's mm -hmm. just like visually, it just stimulates the the eye, you know, when I'm looking right. at it. Yeah, I yeah. Do, I, I should also say like, you know, I, I sometimes get very uh, heady about the esoteric elements in my work, but also on another level, you know, because I'm spending so much time working on these paintings day in and day out for weeks or months at a time, uh, there is a part of it that I'm just sort of like having pleasure making these paintings and sure. yeah, yeah. Doing them physically. Yeah. Um, well, you do a good job of balancing to, to my eye of balancing that pleasure with, uh, you know, a sort of like clear vision of what you want from the painting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I get personally, I sometimes get into trouble when I'm having too much fun and I'll get into <laughs> horror vacui and just cloud up something with too many things. I've gotten a little bit better about not doing that, but it's a long-standing issue with me. I, I actually kind of like that when when your compositions and especially in your drawings are like there's not a single area of space to breathe in and it's all cluttered with marks and yeah I mean sometimes and, I look back fondly on those drawings too but I'm doing them less less and less now but who knows you know things go in waves yeah um, let's see I'm gonna try to go to the next picture here so you I uh, when you gathered some images that you thought would be good to talk about, there's a lot of Bosch. So I selected a couple of Boshes and, you know, I mean, the correlation is really clear. It seems like in terms of like a um, primary compositional reference and a, a sort of launching point for one way to think about the works that you present, he seems like a great metaphorical companion for you, right? Yeah, um, I don't think I, I didn't, you know, funny, it's, it's, might be hard to believe, but I didn't set out to imitate Bosch. Yeah, but no, he, I know that knowing your work, you've gone, it just settled there. It wasn't like you, well, I mean, like yeah, you said, it didn't seem like that to me. Yeah, I've explored a lot of different techniques and, and if anything, I think if there was any artist who I actually like uh, modeled my thinking after it was probably Max Ernst of anyone. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, as like a role model, as an artist. But there is just something about Bosch's work that every time I see it, there is something new that I see in the work. And it's just so um, intensely fascinating and, and enigmatic for me. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I can't help but look at these compositions and feel this familiarity and recognition of these forms. And I actually think that Bosch is pretty ingrained in me from an early age because I remember my, as a little kid, my mother, um, who was actually, she was an art student when she was younger. She went to school at Parsons School of Design in the mm. 60s. And she had all of these uh, art books from the different museums in Europe that she had collected over the years. Mm -hmm. And one of them was from the Prado. And she had, and it had all these details from Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights in it. And I remember, I, you know, I have no idea how young I was, like five years old, you know, four years old, I don't know. But I remember seeing the details of Bosch's paintings at a very, very young age hmm. and just being like, what is this? this you know, I, it, it was just such a, it was something like a, like the kind of work that I might have been familiar with from children's books, but then taken to such an extreme uh, level. And I, and I look at it now and I'm like, yeah, you know, probably it imprinted itself on my subconscious at some mm -hmm. point you know I see the art the, the I think the thing that I recognize now in terms of its relationship to my work is that there's this balance between nature and design mm -hmm. uh, these especially these cryptic um, forms these kind of towers that exist in the background of the Garden of Earthly Delights mm -hmm. because they look like nature they look like plants and minerals and bones, things you would find on the forest floor, but they also have unmistakable hallmarks of design, of mm -hmm. the, the hand of man, like they're mm -hmm. being man-made somehow. Right. Yeah. Um, I often like, you know, I'm, if I'm on the beach and I find a crab claw or something and stick it on a shell, like I feel like I'm having an experience that Bosch was talking about. You know, it's like it's a identifiable, you know, meshing of human the human hand and natural ephemera right is uh, one context yeah. for thinking about his work which you sort of mentioned i think what's interesting about uh the way that you deal with similar compositions is that the hand is so much less clear like we don't know if you're talking about like a post-human future or an alien future or an, you know a, an ancient past or a symbolic space that's abstractive and does not have a tie to the natural world you know uh, and there's just so much, it's different in some ways. So I wonder how do you, uh, do you reconcile like Bosch's ethos? Like does the, is there something in his, um, the kind of like metaphoric, uh, like um, urgency that he presents, you know, uh, the sort of ecclesiastical, you know, nature with this, um, uh, this kind of like prima materia of uh, spiritual investigation and strife and striving, is that, yeah. Is that something that you also riff on or think about, or is it totally that sort of separate in some ways from your work? There, there is in my work a, a personal um, mystical interest and a personal mm -hmm. uh, spiritual interest uh, that reflects itself in the imagery that I, it, or I, for me, a lot of the iconography has a esoteric meaning for me that is, um, I guess I would say spiritual or mystical, I bet, I guess is the best way to describe it. I, I've read a, a lot of different authors on Bosch and I know that the prevailing view of his uh, perspective is one that he is, uh, you know, coming out of Protestant Germany and he's viewing the human world as being fallen and that these are moral uh, allegories mm -hmm. about sin and the essential corruptness of nature and the natural world, uh, that the whole of creation is somehow flawed or mm -hmm. um, uh, damaged and that we have to turn our minds to the spiritual. I definitely don't fully embrace that um, spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time though, you know, he was uh, part of um, a society actually called the, um, 
uh, the Brotherhood of the Blessed Lady, I believe they were called. Hmm. Um, you can check me on that. <laughs> I'm doing this off the top of my head. Um, and, you know, there's no real indication as to what they actually believed, uh, how invested they were in the Protestant idea of sin. And I don't, I don't really know, I, you know, when I look at these, I can't really say where uh, Bosch stands in terms mm -hmm. of his morality or his religious perspective. And I think that these works are so much of their time and they're so enigmatic to us today that when we look at them, um, you know, we can't help but, you know, just kind of try to imagine what the, uh, what the real symbolic meaning behind them would have been. Mm -hmm. um, I would say you, you said something interesting, though, that in my works, they seem to be, you can't tell whether they are a post-human future or whether they are something from the prehistoric past. And that is something that I'm, I've tried to push towards mm -hmm. uh, more so recently. Um, there was a time maybe where my work looked more organic and looked more uh, overtly like something growing out of nature or growing on a forest floor or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, um, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, is, it is in the future and the past at the same time, somewhere mm -hmm. between them both. Bosch right. is very much of his time, mm -hmm. but yet his work is so cryptic that it still seems mysterious and relevant today. You know, yeah. Somehow. Cool. Yeah, well um, said. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have a lot of images, so I'll just keep flipping through anytime there's like a pause. Ah, uh, yeah, more Bosch. More Bosch. Yeah, so I, I selected this one out of the ones that you provided just because um, I felt like that conversation about what are the little dewdrops in your uh, in your paintings might mm -hmm. have, maybe you had included this as like a way to communicate something about that. Like there's something really lovely about this one little moment that you've isolated out of Bosch's. Well, this is, this is such a great detail. Yeah. And my understanding of the metaphor here is that, you know, I've often looked at this and it looks like a delicate uh, membrane growing out of a flower. Mm -hmm. And it almost looks like these two lovers or like an Adam and Eve like figure are growing mm -hmm. inside the membrane, like they're being uh, gestated or something inside this plant plant shell mm -hmm. um, but I've I've read that the metaphor actually is that they are in a in a kind of a globe of glass and mm -hmm. what we're actually seeing are cracks forming around the shell of glass and this is a, a Bosch creating a kind of allegory for uh, love that is you know hanging on by a tether and it's just about to shatter and dissipate mm -hmm. um, which is really fatalistic and super negative but um, I think that's fair enough, but when I look at this, though, and I relate it to my own work, there's a lot of parts of my work that are, um, they're kind of like these delicate, um, shells, what I call shells, um, and I, I think about them as being sort of, um, hermetic, uh, worlds within worlds, mm -hmm. uh, they are almost like a kind of, um, alchemist's show globe where a chemical process would take place or even in the early years of the enlightenment when you know scientists would do demonstrations uh inside um who's that artist um he has a famous painting now i'm trying to think of where a man is showing how he can cut the air off of a of the inside of a glass sphere and cause this bird to pass out oh i'll think about it later and remind you um, but, uh, you know, these show globes used to be places where um, scientific demonstrations would take place. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think about that when I'm painting them in my, in my own work. Uh, when these translucent orbs appear, to me, uh, that is my, that's kind of like the symbolic language I've settled on mm -hmm. for describing a kind of sealed hermetic world within a world. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. That sort of like gets at a couple of things that I think, well, one thing I'd want to mention is just that I, I always love when this happens, that I see this corollary and thought uh, between us that I didn't know about before, um, which is that uh, for a few years, I was working on this series called the Metropolis series, which was this big city map where the various vectors of the city had different kind of ideological meanings. Mm -hmm. And one of them, the, uh, the sort of verdant south was controlled by these things called the globules that were basically 
beads that held microcosmic universes inside of them that had so much kind of psychic resonance that they had this incredibly uh, powerful pull over the, the idolized, idolized city's form. Um, so it sounds kind of like similar to what you're talking about. But, and then yeah, the other thing I was gonna mention similar. is just that uh, it also calls into question scale in your paintings in a way, like that's another thing. Another one of the many mysteries about them to me is like, how large are these things? Like, are these like <laughs> human scale kind of alien beings or are they microcosmic little like, uh, you know, single celled organisms or are they universes, you know? And this is like the yeah. structure of the universe. So it's, it's interesting to hear you talk about microcosmic space within them as being this uh, sort of element of your thought process. Yeah, that is interesting. I, it's, it's funny because I, I've said this a lot, but uh, maybe I've already said this, but there's kind of a, an exoteric side to my artwork and there's also an esoteric side. Mm -hmm. So the exoteric is usually just what I tell people when they're like, so what's your work like? What do you do? And I usually will say, well, I make abstract paintings that are based on a kind of system that I've created for myself. Um, and then the esoteric side is that I do have this system behind my work that it doesn't dictate the way I make my paintings, but it does inform the iconography that I repeat over and over again in my work. Mm -hmm. And um, I do have all of this kind of figured out a little bit in my head of what the scale is and what these things represent. Um, and I do have very specific meanings for certain things, but now that you've said, I'm not sure whether these are really large or whether these are microcosmic, I don't know if I wanna, want to answer yes or no to that. I mean, <laughs> as above, so below, right? Like, yeah, right. right. Maybe, maybe I don't want to answer that. Yeah. You know? Maybe that's, cool. uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, let me see. Let's go to the next image All and right. see if that prompts a conversational shift. Ah, uh, Ernest. Oh, uh, yeah. Ernest Haeckel. Ernest Haeckel, yes. Yeah. Well, this, uh, I mean, I can just start talking about Ernest Haeckel. I mean, Ernst Haeckel is an artist who, I got the book Art Forms in Nature, mm -hmm. like, all the way back when I was in college. Yeah, me too. I think that was like, a, like yeah, like around that same time. Somebody like around ago. 2001 yeah. or so, 2002, um, this was like a book, and I still have my copy from college, and it's just always been in my studio, and I mm -hmm. still have it with like, it's a paint, you know, stuck on it and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, I mean, I don't even know if I need to explain <laughs> my connections here, you know? Yeah, I, th I think we've sort of gone over some of those points a little bit, like the ideas of nature, you know, the sort of like uh, the, the beautiful uh, operas that nature creates, you know? And also, uh, you know, Haeckel is coming out of that same enlightenment sensibility where he's trying to take essentially what is the chaos of nature. You know, like these forms are jellyfish. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you've ever seen jellyfish washed up on the sea, they look like nothing. They look amorphous. Totally. Uh, yeah. But Haeckel is taking these sea creatures or these microorganisms and he's trying to uh, depict them in a way that is unnaturally, um, empirical and precise and delineated. He's trying to impose a kind of human sense of, of symmetry and order on something that just doesn't conform to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is that kind of empirical enlightenment space and re, uh, reconceptualization of nature that I'm, I'm, I think I mentioned already, you know. Sure, yeah, and I think, you know, for me, like the way that he creates his compositions is very unique. Um, you know, like this page, this plate, it really reminds me of alchemical drawings, right? Which are oh, yeah. doing the same kind of thing. They're taking the messy human experience and trying and spiritual experience and trying to codify it somehow, you know, as this very balanced, uh, integral, like space that you can even act within, right? In a, a way that's going to have outcomes or, or meanings for you. Um, yeah, that's that's a great connection. Actually, I do also love, you know, like the Mutus Lieber and all of those alchemical books that have these intricate, intricate uh, imagery in them mm -hmm. that take these really abstract concepts of spirituality or alchemy and try to condense them into palatable 
imagery like, you know, the burning salamander or the um, resurrected king or, you know, all of these other kinds of imagery trying to um, uh, clarify it in a symbolic way. And, and I do think there is a connection there with Haeckel. I, I hadn't really even thought about that before, but I think that's a, uh, a fair connection. A fair yeah, I just think that his compositions are really unique compared to the way that you might see a plate in like an Audubon book or something, which is oh, yeah. like, uh, you know, more textbook sort of graphic design oriented. But yeah, but that's something that I think we can talk about your work uh, in reference to that too. But yeah, this is an early work, right? So we're mm. going back, back in time a little bit. Yeah, so this piece actually is from 2002, 2003. So this is a really, really old work. Uh, you know, as I was saying, I had Ernst Haeckel books in my studio at SUNY Purchase when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of work that I was making at that time. Mm -hmm. And even though I left this, uh, this way of making work for a long time and then, uh, you know, returned to it uh, again and again, you know, I would experiment with different things and then I would return to it. I mean, this is what, like 20 years ago or mm -hmm. something like that, you know, over 20 years ago. Um, I still though look at the work that I made when I was younger and I recognize that I was thinking about, even if I wasn't able to articulate it at the time, I was thinking about a lot of the same ideas that I'm fleshing out now in mm -hmm. my in my paintings. This is yeah, also, absolutely. by the way, like a massive painting because I was just ridiculous when I was in undergrad, you know, when you're like 21 years old, uh, you never really think, you know, I'm going to have to get an apartment and <laughs> store this, you know, or I'm never going to have, uh, you know, my parents garage again, you know, where I can, you know, store this thing. And so I made these giant paintings. I think this is like 20, no, uh, I'm sorry, 72 by 78 inches. Uh, so it's you know, pretty big. Um, and I would just like work on these massive paintings in this little studio that they gave me at the school. Mm -hmm. And we had these storage racks at the school and they were really big. And I just was always like, oh, so I'm gonna make paintings as big as I wanna make them. Um, but um, yeah. I, I, I did the same thing. I mean, it's part of the, the same reason, you know, the same reason that youth creates so much folly in general, <laughs> like yeah. the imperviousness of experience. Not that I, like, I love giant paintings and I love the experience that I've had making giant paintings and I still do it occasionally, despite all the reasons not to, but like, but yeah, I mean, when I look at this painting, I sort of do see something very different in it. Uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of similarities that I can see as well, but like, one thing that's different about it is just it's uh, kind of, I feel like it has more interest in uh, the uh, modernist like project of abstract painting in general. Like I kind of see similar uh, compositional traits to like, you know, the way that like, um, I don't know, like Amy Silman would make a painting or like, uh, you know, Frankenthaler or something, you know, this sort of like, uh, it just feels like it's more part of the vernacular of like modernist Western painting. Whereas the stuff you're doing now feels like it's a leap into something quite different, you know, that mm. it's still, obviously it's still modernist American painting to some extent, but it's like you're, you've put your cards on the table in a different way and are less, maybe less interested in, in uh, the kind of like classical, well, I wouldn't call it classical history, but the kind of like canon of, of uh, paintings trajectory in the West. Yeah, that's, that's possibly very true. I, I have, um, I have conflicted ideas about, I, I think I have conflicted ideas about the modern linear narrative about art and where it's come to. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, and even looking at this work now, I probably was more influenced by modernist painting, like the artists you describe, like, you know, Silman, of course, and, um, and at the time, I think Laura Owens was an artist that I was looking at at the time. Sure, her yeah. work has changed a great deal since then. Um, other artists too, but um, I um, I look at this work now, and I even recognize that those modernist um, tropes and the modernist style of painting 
come from different sources that are not necessarily from the Western canon. Um, like I look at this work and I also see, um, you know, Japanese like hokusai mm -hmm. asymmetrical compositions where it's really heavily weighted on one side. And, mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if I had, and I, you know, I don't remember whether I was aware of all of those prints like hokusai and uh, the other like Yukioi kind of artists. I don't know if I was aware of them, but there's a kind of um, maybe an unintentional connection to that history in a way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've always I heard of that as being one of the foundational elements of the way that abstraction, you know, sort of arose in, in Europe or whatnot. It is. A, uh, you know, it really is part of the foundation yeah. of that. Um, I still, I, I have to say, I look at this and, um, you know, I, I, and this is like me getting nostalgic maybe, I don't know, but I, I'm not like, um, you know, a big part of my current work is symmetry. And I think that's a theme that a lot of people pick up on right away because it's like the composition is right there. It's right in front of you and it's symmetrical. You can see it on both sides. But I, I do actually like asymmetrical compositions. And if there's one thing I would return to that I see in this, um, this larger work from when I was younger is, um, you know, I, I, I could see new compositions involving this kind of asymmetry, this kind of lopsided. Yeah. Well, I saw it in some of the images you sent me of your most recent paintings. I started to see that happening a little bit more, it seemed like to me. Um, and I've always liked one of the, my favorite things about your works is how, you know, the first read of, of them is often that they must have been made, you know, with a CAD program or something. They're like super perfect. And then you kind of look a little closer and you can see that it's quite hand done. And you have areas where like, you know, one side of the painting will be slightly different than the other one quite forcibly, you know, so. But yeah, I. I, I know what you mean also about nostalgia and sometimes looking back at your older work and being like, whoa, like, how did I do that? Like, I'm so caught up in this very particular way of making art right now. And what would happen yeah. if I just made that goofy thing that I or tried to adapt to that goofy sensibility that I used to have? Yeah, yeah. Um, right. But you, actually, you mentioned something that I did want to bring up about symmetry and the compositions. Um, you know, my work does have symmetrical compositions, but they're not perfect at all. Mm -hmm. And I do like those handmade traces. Ah, yes, I remember this one. Yeah, I threw this one in here at the last minute. I was like, oh yeah, I remember this painting. When I did that studio visit with you, like, you know, several years ago, <clears throat> this was one of my favorite painting. And I think we got to include this in a show that yeah. Carrie and I did. I on... think this was around the time when we first met, I was making works like this. Yeah, um, talk about, you know, the... symmetry, dis you know, the lack of symmetry in this painting, you know I mean? Like it's an interesting transitional, body of work, I guess, or something, or it feels like I can see some color sensibilities that you still have in your most recent paintings. Um, but like, I also see some other quite other things going on. Yeah, what, what was this one I about think again? this is, what, is it called like a pagan nightmare in the mind of Felishine Rops or something like that? I think I called Sounds it. Sounds about right, yeah. Um, yeah, I, see the yeah. Word Rops I, in the I think in this, you know, and actually, this is, I think, why we both got interested in the idea of starting speculative arts research, uh, you know, a couple of years ago now, is that we both have an interest in liter literature or literary ideas mm -hmm. paralleling a visual art practice. Mm -hmm. So I've always had a kind of writing practice or an interest in literature or history that overlapped with my actual paintings even if i don't exhibit them together or share them together mm -hmm. so uh, a lot of these paintings were running parallel to writings or books that i was reading or kinds of literature that were influencing me at the time and i think a lot of the material that was influencing me when i made this work still influences me today i've just found a different language or a different way of representing it. Um, but this particular work, these were very interesting when I made them. And I was very excited about, I did a lot of these paintings for uh, a couple of years. And I was interested in making the paintings more overtly narrative. And so I started turning my abstract biomorphic forms into these kind of figures or characters and sometimes I would include text, like you can actually see Rops' name in the, in the painting. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then I would also include sometimes really um, uh, irregular or uh, chaotic materials. Right. Uh, so yeah. some of these paintings from this period, this one in particular, I know it has gold paint in it and it also has uh, walnut ink in it. And some of the other works from this period, I would sometimes glue crystals into them. And what I was interested in is one thing, both the, um, the, the inherent text within the, or the symbolic text within the materials or within the objects that I was placing onto the work, and that those would become part of the narrative that I was explaining visually with the work. And this particular work, I, I kind of, um, well, you know, well, Fellishing Rops, of course, you know, did all those, you know, uh, diabolicals, you know, the images of, um, you know, women worshiping these giant uh, Herma statues with giant right. erections and they're like right. um, satyrs and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. they're sort of sexual, decadent, you know, um, uh, late 19th century symbolist uh, paintings. And well, mm -hmm. So he did some paintings, but mostly I think of his work as being prints or drawings. Right. So this was kind of like my take on a Fellishing Rocks theme with um, this kind of green man or um, not exactly a satyr. I don't know really what it is, like a kind of a monster. And it's sort of like having some kind of sex orgy with this red uh you know weird nymph like female form mm -hmm. in a in a strange jungle where everything is kind of exploding and transforming um so that's you know was my thinking on a literary level but uh but also what was going on during this time which is very important for the work i'm doing now is that i was getting into more of a personal practice of meditating on the paintings and using meditation as a way to enter into a kind of trance state while I was working on these paintings. Hmm. So while the imagery has a, a parallel to literature that I was working on, I would actually start these works by doing automatic drawing and sometimes just meditating or staring at stains or mm -hmm. weird combinations of material, like I would mix ash and walnut ink together and then kind of like splatter it onto a page and use that uh, almost like the way people use a scrying mirror. Right. You know, go yeah, it's a really essential thing. technique for me too. I know I, I work like that a lot for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, do you still do that or is that sort of uh, no longer like, cause this feels quite different than your current practice in many ways. Yeah. Is that, uh, what was I, the transfer like or the transference? I think after a while I just, wasn't able to go into that zone anymore. Mm -hmm. um, for like a, a long time, I was making these paintings and they were coming very quickly to me and I was getting these images. And then after a while, it just, it, it kind of, I, I couldn't, I couldn't have that kind of um, um, uh, paradoilia experience where I'd be meditating and then all of a sudden I'd see something appear mm -hmm. in the image. Um, I don't know what happened really, but um, I would say that I still go into a meditative trance before beginning to draw or plan the imagery in my work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is still part of my practice and it's kind of um, a way of, uh, I just really just clear my mind of every thought as best as I can. Mm -hmm. And I will almost naturally start to see the the next painting or the next kind of inspiration, you know, coming into focus. Um, but it's not the same experience as what I was doing here. It's something very different. And yeah. I found that what was happening to me when I was doing these works is that I was um, seeing a lot of kind of imagery and chaotic imagery and figurative imagery. And nowadays it's more just kind of like, I just see the whole thing. Uh, fully finished in a form, mm. in a way, um, and then it's just I'm trying to jot that down later in a sketchbook or something like that. That's pretty um, interesting. So it's it's moved out of using this sort of chaos of materials into just piece putting the pieces together in my mind. 
Um, and, you know, I, those things happen, you know, it, it's just kind of comes in and out of phase. I do still, you know, when I look at these, I like a lot of the textures that I was doing at the time and, you know, a lot of the colors. And I think those have stayed similar. I also, there was a transitional period where I was using this kind of texture and practice and then painting imagery that looks a lot like what I'm doing here. But then after a while, I found that I was just almost adding the texture for aesthetic reasons. Right. And it wasn't actually helping me to, it wasn't, you know, helping me to have a kind of a vision or like this kind of work, you know? Right. Uh, and I was kind of like, eh, why would I add, you know, these, these marks anymore if they're not mm. really um, creating uh, the space for me? That's so interesting. I mean, like looking at them back to back, it sort of feels like you can really see the chrysalis, you know, disintegrating between one kind of form and the other. Um, you know, going from that space of uh, kind of like rapidly evolving image mystery, you know, like you were talking about with your kind of automatist practice um, into something that's more refined, you know, mm -hmm. um, and like the metaphor that's arising in my mind to kind of correlate that is uh, like dream, through the process of like dreaming, you know, there's like these times when you're uh, paying attention to your dreams that you get these crystal clear images that are just immaculate and symbolic, you know, often at the precipice of sleep and waking versus the like flux of narrative that happens in kind of like deeper REM state dreaming, you know, that there's, there's two very divergent states of dreaming, which have been written about pretty extensively, the fleeting clarity of image versus the, uh, the highly narrativized, you know, kind of, uh, Poetry. Yes, and I and I would say that uh, when I am trying to configure these forms or you know meditate on them, the effect is like when you're going in the hypnagogic state and you're just about going into sleep and you start to just kind of see things manifesting and you know and that is an interesting experience mm -hmm. and it's different than dream. Yeah, um, yeah, very different. Sure, I actually. Very weird thing, and then we can talk about this painting. I've actually, and maybe this is too much information, but I've actually stopped remembering my dreams in the last couple of years. I don't know what happened. Yeah. It's very strange. I used to have the most vivid dreams, and I just don't remember them anymore. Yeah, dreaming has been a very weird thing for me, because yeah. I did that uh, dream journaling project with Jesse, which like yeah. was so intense, and was everything was so vivid. And then when it ended, I have basically no dream recall, and it's now been five years or so of a very little dream recall. Well, when I interview you and do a studio visit with you, I am going to ask you more about that experience because I think that was very interesting. The it kind of a, mapping. Yeah, that was definitely like a uh, sort of like um, a, a hinge moment in my practice. Yeah, and a lot of mapping this dream world. Um, you know, and and actually, when I look at these works, which I still um, I still really get a lot out of them, and they and to me even though they are aesthetically different in terms of the palette and the process of making them from the works I've been making in the last, uh, you know, these are from about three or four years ago. Uh, so they're not that long ago, really. Um, so the transition for me is more subtle than maybe it appears to others. Um, to me, it's really just a shift of the palette and some of the techniques that I'm using, mm -hmm. but the, forms and the images still mean a lot of the same things to me um yeah, i mean like my feeling as an outside observer is just that they've become more confident in themselves like these mm -hmm. characters and creatures have sort of leveled up right like here they're in some kind of like chthonic state of like uh you know that's still more earthbound and yeah. they've kind of uh, unleashed themselves into the outer cosmos in your new works <laughs> in a way that's like uh, telling of their, their either their power or their scale, you know, like I would never look at this and say, well, I mean, I guess I could under a certain science fictic, fictive, like frame of mind, like maybe this is the universe or maybe this is like, uh, you know, a, a representation of like all spiritual experience or something. But then your newer works kind of have like a, I don't know, they feel like they're kind of like just they went to a different D and D level or something and can do something, <laughs> something a little bit more powerful or, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, these seem more to be uh, biological creatures or forms when I'm looking at them now, even though I, I wasn't thinking about them that way at the time in a weird sense. Um, but when I look at them and compare them to the newer paintings that I've done, 
um, they don't have that uh, diagrammatic uh, mapped sort of element that brings them into um, a sort of a different zone where it's more ambiguous about whether what you're looking at is really organic or not. Yeah, their physics and, is quite a bit more believable here. They still feel like they're held together with sinew and, you know, uh, roots and like fungal spore, you know, um, yeah. it's very, they have a very physical quality to them. Whereas the new ones have like a lot more like piercing lines and kind of like anti-gravity effects are going on. And it's just, it's a lot less uh, clear exactly where their space of existence is. Yeah. And this actually, this one in particular is a uh, very early in the development of some of the iconography, actually. This is one of the first where I began to develop those kind of, um, you know, what I call crystalline forms, you know, crystals mm -hmm. um, and these sort of uh, translucent cells uh, or um, shells. Uh, you know, this is the first appearance of those. It's not really long after the uh, Felishine Rocks painting. Mm -hmm. that I started yeah, doing. no, I remember that pretty quick. Um, quick switchover happening in the work yeah. I was seeing you make. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I threw this one in here because every time I look at those older works, I just, I always think about this image from an old video game called Star Control. Uh, <laughs> this is the Urquan, who are like the kind of, uh, you know, the diabolical evil alien presence among many alien presences. And, you know, I've, I've been around your work a lot, like in kind of gallery settings and things like that. And there's definitely a fairly high percentage of people that walks up to them and says, whoa, that looks like an alien. <laughs> so I wonder, like, what is your relationship to aliens? Like, is there something there? How do you, what do you think about aliens <laughs> in relation to your work? Or have you ever seen a UFO? Or like, no, no however you want to approach that question. I'm curious about aliens in your work. Um, I do, I do think there is something interesting. I'm, I'm glad you asked me about UFOs, actually. Uh, I do think about them a great deal, or um, extraterrestrial life or the abduction phenomenon. Uh, Jacques Vallée is a big influence on my way of thinking about that. Um, I am not familiar with this weird uh, space spider, this Lovecraftian space spider thing. Uh, it is funny though, because um, it kind of does look like a video game version of one of my paintings. Yeah, well, what I think what's uh, interesting about it is, again, that, like, symmetry, right? Like, if they're trying, whoever the artist is that made this creature, uh, you know, what was scary was, first of all, his spider-like, you know, clearly carnivorous appendages and little tentacles and things like that. Um, but then also, like, the symmetry of those eyes, right? It's like this, like, real power, like, he reverberates uh, this, like, geometric inner space that's like going to be very very hard to defy like mm. uh you know i have a, a friend dave matoran who was making works that involved these very dark uh kind of crystalline glyphs and he would call them immovable objects they were there to represent a kind of sublimity that was uh dangerously powerful you know in his mind but i don't always get the sense of that in your your new works that there's any kind of danger or there's any kind of like uh you know like i should be troubled by the appearance of these things they feel like pretty inviting but sometimes in your old works they would be sort of like you know is this a lovecraftian creature of the you know outer outer cosmos that you know is confronting us malevolently or or not you know yeah i mean i'm not sure there is something to that and i'm not sure where the um essence of that kind of um there is something to symmetry it, it announces a kind of design intelligence mm -hmm. that is both part of nature but sometimes beyond nature as well mm -hmm. or it's that it is sublime in a way because it's something we recognize in nature but it just goes almost beyond what we expect from nature you know we're like how is that how is it possible it's it's uncanny or, or um when you confront it mm -hmm. um i I don't overtly think about extraterrestrial life as being the source of my paintings, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think about the place that the cosmos has in our mind mm -hmm. and our relationship to the world beyond our solar system. And um, I, I guess, you know, my perspective is that if there is some kind of, oh, this is an interesting one. 
if there is some kind of extraterrestrial life, and if it is uh, significantly more advanced than us, it's going to have a different understanding of the nature of the universe and the nature mm -hmm. of physics. Um, and that will probably boggle our minds more than the actual physical presence of the thing itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, I, I have a lot of thoughts in that regard. Um, yeah, I'm with you on that one too. I think we've talked about this before, but yeah, my general uh, premise of thinking about UFOs is that they're so, they're probably so different than us that we probably can't grasp their presence, but that doesn't mean that they can't grasp our presence necessarily. And they may have uh, some kind of sway over, over reality or something that we don't quite understand. They might have a totally different perspective on reality and what, you know, the, the whole mechanics of the universe might appear different to them. Their motives mm -hmm. might appear different. Um, I'm also, by the way, not uh, completely convinced that one needs technology in order to travel vast distances in mm -hmm. outer space. I suspect that there might be some loophole in physics and time that might allow transportation between various points in space and other dimensions, but that might be another. Yeah, we might need a whole video to... on that one at some point. <laughs> yeah, um, um, but yeah, yeah, I just put this, this image here because of the drawing process. I wanted to take a look at some of those uh, generative works, I guess. Is this one of the ones where you would kind of like stare into, uh, into lamp black or something and kind of yes. draw an image? Yeah, exactly. I was using the fumage technique and I was uh, using a, uh, a candle and I would just cover the entire sheet of paper with the candle soot and just do these page after page. And then I began by doing a lot of um, automatic drawings on these uh, sheets of soot. Um, I still have a lot of these drawings. This one came out really uh, delicately and it's much more fully realized. Some of them I would just take a, um, uh, a stick or a, a kind of um, uh, uh, etching tool and I would just scratch into the paper mm. and create these forms that way, just using whatever was at hand. Um, but I found that the really dense sooty material was a almost like a black scrying mirror. It was a good way to generate imagery in my mind and, and to see things. And this is just one of those weird things that emerged and you know. Is this one of them too, or is this, uh, this is a little different, right? This so this is like... actually a different work that I had, I was, I was working out new ideas for compositions, and this is now uh, a couple of years old, uh, two, maybe even older than that, but I still am keeping this, uh, this and the series of works that I did from this, um, you know, at hand because I liked a lot of the concepts, the compositional concepts that emerged from it. Mm -hmm. um, but this was, I think this appeared in a zine that someone did actually, but this was a technique that I was doing where I would just paint an entire sheet of paper with um, Sumi ink or, or India ink. I'm not sure what I was using. And I would, t and after it had dried, I would take white gouache and a very, very small brush, and I would just delicately render all these uh, mm. forms. And as I went along working on it, like with this work, which was a much more developed version of this, I started zoning off the sheet of paper. And, you know, and I was talking about this a little bit before, I've been interested in these kind of uh, worlds within worlds and how to represent microcosms within the macrocosm. And uh, that's what I was trying to mm -hmm. depict in a, in a certain kind of way, in a way that's very different than my paintings now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I still like a lot of the qualities here. There's, you know, these zones that are very clearly uh, sectioned off. And I yeah, I was, I was kind of into this one just because of the landscape uh, motif, you know, that there's like this uh, space is being carved out for something to happen in, um, in a way that's, you know, it does remind me a little bit of your most most recent paintings, which I hope we can get to uh, pretty quickly. Like, oh, yes. yeah, like this one, but especially maybe, oh, okay. Well, 
Maybe we well, can we'll go get back to this. This is this is the one I was thinking of. This oh yeah. One. Like oh yeah, like landscape is like reasserting itself, and like now, there is a real relationship between these like kind of divine, uh, you know, sort of creatures or or proposals, idealized proposals for reality codification, and this like landscape. You know, it's like they've touched down on Earth, and you know, and maybe they're gonna uh some act is going to happen in your new work that's going to be even even more different or more uh like tactile in terms of the way that they operate in our own lives or something yeah i, I like where you're thinking about these actually and this particular piece which is a pretty new uh painting pretty recent painting um this does go in a direction i don't want to say direction i i don't like I, I don't, um, some artists like plan their trajectory uh, of where they're going to move their art. I don't like to do that too much because it blocks myself off. It, I feel like it'll block me off from being open to uh, outside influences. But um, something happened in this particular painting that I definitely need to return to, I feel, mm -hmm. um, that I haven't tapped into fully. And there's something happening, both asymmetry is appearing in the composition overall, but it has a more um, architectural feeling to it. Uh, the landscape that's brought in at the bottom, you know, it's a almost a abstract representation of a landscape. Mm -hmm. It gives it, to me, this kind of design-like feel, like it's a proposal for some kind of anti-gravity building or something. Um, oh, nice. I, yeah. It reminds me of uh, like the uh, Chicago Imagist paintings a little bit too. For some reason, when you bring in like a uh, landscape reference or a scale reference, um, you know, and maybe this one just has a little bit of a softer, cartoonier vibe or something. Like too. Uh, Roger Brown, maybe with like the that... yeah, or like Jim Nutt. Like, did you guys? I know you went to school in Chicago, right? Yes, yeah, so I had Jim Nutt as an advisor. Yes. Did you? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I did. I did my MFA at the Art Institute of Chicago and. I would say Jim Nutt was an advisor, but I also had the artist Barbara Rossi as an advisor, who's a Chicago imagist as well. Mm -hmm. And I would say Barbara Rossi's art and her approach to making art uh, was actually a huge influence for me at that time, hmm. um, which is kind of a long time ago now. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, she was also an artist who would go into a kind of um, you know, as she described it to me, she would go into a kind of meditative or trance state when making her work where it felt like time would stop, you know, and time wouldn't move outside of the realm where you're making your work. And I try to emulate getting into that kind of zone uh, as well when I'm working on these pieces. Sure. So, uh, I, you know, um, not to get off on a tangent, but uh, definitely there is a Chicago imagist influence. I don't know, you know, see, the thing is, though, I don't overtly think of historical or contemporary references when I'm working on my paintings. So, I, mm -hmm. you know, if, if there is some kind of language that I am um, drawing into my own work, like Chicago Imagist or Hieronymus Bosch or science fiction or something like that, I think it is really moving below the surface of my awareness you know it's mm -hmm. something very subconscious um yeah, that attitude like i you know i really believe in like a middle way of like working through the world spiritually and artistically that like there's some things that are uh that like the most potent and valuable artistic experiences and conduits for your work are going to be the ones that are the least tangible sometimes Mm -hmm. right things that are just part of your life and that move through you in a very fluid way and and your human valve can kind of uh utilize them without thinking about it too hard or trying too hard but yeah mm -hmm. i mean chicago imagists are to me like a pretty interesting group of artists you know I, ca I can't certainly can't say that i'm like an expert in the movement but like i've always loved the way that they uh i think that they like kind of had a pragmatic like collectivist ideal of like uh sort of like being very uh open-ended in terms of the way that they would approach symbolism but also like tying it down to like very uh mundane kind of like human spaces like 
which to me is like when you talk about architecture there's like maybe a relationship there like your recent video is talking about readdressing architecture and thinking about you know our current uh moment and and the challenges of the moment and the way that like maybe that reaffirms an interest in doing something that's almost utilitarian you know uh in terms of like the kinds of statements you're making like how does how do these extremely esoterically potent omnipotent beings like interact with the human sphere and and make change for the better or what is it where's the space where our life interacts with these things i don't know I'm just riffing. No, that. no, I I do uh, think about that, and it's it's perhaps maybe utopian. I don't know, you know, it's one of these things. It's like, can art guide us to a place that is better or more positive? Can design actually improve the world? Can it take into consideration um, metaphysical or environmental uh, issues, and perhaps point in a positive, better direction mm -hmm. and i and i hope that there might be some kernel of that um utopian imagining or envisioning in my work i yeah. do think of it that way I, I think about these works as being um i i'm always thinking about the future of these mm -hmm. paintings how they can maybe be used by someone else as a source of inspiration <laughs> you know maybe that's a little I, too grand to be imagining that for myself no, I mean, I think, I think about that a lot too as an artist. Like, it's sort of like, even though I'm making work for myself and for, you know, self-revelation and many other therapeutic reasons and all kinds of stuff, like, part of the project is definitely this, like, future logical, like, uh, communication, you know, it's trying yeah. to, like, create some kind of ideal that might reverberate for some future generation in a way that's helpful. And I don't think we're alone in that, you know? I feel like the whole romantic uh, sort of, like, project is, is rooted in in this kind of like uh, tradition of um, of trying to recodify uh, psychotechnologically like the way that we might exist as a civilization. Yeah, I, I do think ideally, you know, the ideal of artists is to find some kind of um, empathetic, somewhat accessible way to draw people into a, a new vision of theirs and to maybe point them uh, towards visions of their own, ideally. Um, I mean, that's the ideal. Not everything is going to do that. Not everything's going to accomplish that, um, you know, but uh, it's interesting because this painting is actually called Paths of Healing. And when I was working on it, there was this feeling like, uh, as I was connecting the different, um, the different channels or the different, uh, you know, what I think of as channels, you know, which are these connecting grid-like lines between structures. I was having a lot of anxiety at the time, and it was almost as if, uh, as I connected all of these parts, I felt that kind of leaving me as these connected with each other. And maybe it was just I was feeling anxiety about finishing painting. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> you know, something something was leaving me as I was working on this that was very uh, beneficial, and so I called it Paths of Healing. And now when you're making these connections to architecture and the current videos that I've been posting on Instagram where I'm talking about utopian ideas about architecture and design, you know, which are inspired by the current moment where we're all trapped inside our apartments and our houses and stuff, uh, you know, trying to quarantine ourselves. Um, as you say that, I look at this work and it does have a kind of, you know, those perfect uh, you know, idealized uh, geometric rolling green hills do have a kind of utopian, mm -hmm. futuristic Garden of Eden like quality to them that I maybe wasn't wasn't really aware of at the time. Yeah, yeah, and there's like definitely like a, a Corbusier kind of like hopefulness in it. You know that yeah. like maybe you know this kind of SimCity 2000 arcology you know planning can somehow <laughs> help us negotiate away from some of the problems we're facing. Yeah, I don't but know I how feel... it would actually work in a practical design. Oh yeah, I mean, so far yeah. it hasn't, but yeah, yeah. Like, we got to keep trying, right? Yeah. Well, I kind of feel like maybe that's a good endpoint for our, our uh, little talk. I don't want to go too long, and I did have some more slides, but uh, you know, at the same time, this feels like a poetic space to 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 leave leave off. So yeah, maybe I'll stop sharing now. Yeah, that's good. Oh, hey there. Hey, yeah, we're back. <laughs> Full screen. Okay.
So, uh, so yeah, do you want to say anything else to the viewers out in TV land? Like, um, can you, can you <laughs> or wherever we're posting this. Right. Um, I mean, I, I could go on and on about my work, but I thought, you know, that was, uh, we covered a lot of interesting things that I wanted to talk about. Cool. Um, I'm looking forward to doing a studio visit with you and checking out some, especially talking about some of your new paintings that you've been doing. Yeah. The ones that yeah, yeah, totally. I'm psyched about that. And I like this format that we've settled on. Like it felt, uh, like good to have images flowing and kind of be open-ended in the conversation and uh, I want to do that with more people so I think it's going to be yeah. going to be a good project. And we're still going to um, have the literary online pdf of SAR. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been putting that on hold for a while for understandable reasons uh, just a lot of life things and you know world things going on at the at the moment um, but I like this as a another branch of this project and maybe a maybe a more accessible branch in some ways. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite things. I mean, we can talk about this more when we really talk about the project specifically, yeah. but I, I'm in my studio so often just like looking for stuff to listen to, you know, and like I would love to hear more artists talking about what they do, especially from our community and people that have interests like ours. And I think it's, you know it's going to be fruitful. So yeah, I'm looking yeah, that's to what I'm part. hoping. If we're interested in, uh, you know, hearing more content like this, maybe others will be interested in sharing or checking it out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll see where it goes. Cool, man. All right. Well, I'm going to stop uh, the recording and hope to God it actually worked and, <laughs> and I will see you soon. All right. All right. Bye, Alessandro. Bye-bye, man.